Good morning, and thank you for joining us for ITIP's event, Speeding Cures for Patients, How Congress Can Update the Prescription Drug User Fee Act to Spur Biopharmaceutical Innovation. I'm Stephen Ezell. I'm the Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, and I'll be your moderator this morning. So this event comes at a propitious time, with the House Energy and Commerce Committee expected to begin marking up the the six legislation tomorrow. And we have an all-star panel joining us this morning to discuss that. What I'd like to do is introduce the panelists, take about five minutes for remarks myself, and then I'll turn it back to our panel. Uh, this morning, we will first hear from Representative Ron Cleek, who was a senior policy advisor in Nelson Mullins, Riley, and Scarborough's Washington, D.C. office. A former member of the House of Representatives, he was first elected to the Congress in 1992 and served four consecutive terms, representing the 4th Congressional District of Pennsylvania. Representative, thank you for joining us this morning. Next, we'll hear from Susan Winkler, who was the president of Leavitt Partners Consulting, a national healthcare consulting firm and Chief Risk Management Officer for Love Partners. She previously served as the CEO of the Food and Drug Law Institute and as Chief of Staff of the Food and Drug Administration from 2007 to 2009. At the FDA, Ms. Winkler managed the Commissioner's Office, serving as the Commissioner's <coughs> Senior Staff Advisor and representing the FDA for a variety of stakeholders. Uh, Susan, thank you for joining us. After Susan, we'll hear from Ms. Cynthia Dent, who is the Vice President of Public Policy at the nonprofit Alliance for Aging Research, where she is responsible for guiding the organization's federal policy work uh, and directing all aspects of their Accelerate Cure Treatments for Alzheimer's Disease and Aging in Emotion Coalitions. Cynthia also serves as the immediate past president of the Alliance for a Stronger FDA Board of Directors and a founding member of the Executive Committee. Uh, member of Friends on the National Institute of Aging. Thank you, Cynthia. And then, lastly, but not least, here from Keisha Brooks Coley, who was a senior director at the Procedure Human Alliances with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Um, she also serves as executive director of the Patient Quality of Life Coalition at the ACCAN. Uh, she previously served as a professional staff member on the Senate Health Committee. Uh, around 11 o'clock, we will be joined by Representative Diana DeGette of Colorado. I'll introduce the representative at that time. So, if I might start with a few minutes of, of remarks. So, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, during the midst of the AIDS epidemic, uh, pharmaceutical companies really unleashed a wave of medical research and scientific innovation. Uh, conducting uh, clinical trials on scores of drugs, submitting drug applications to the FDA that were run into the half millions of pages. They'd submit boxes and boxes of information to a warehouse at FDA, but sometimes when these same companies would come back a year or two later to submit additional information on clinical trials for these new drugs, they'd see actually unopened boxes of applications they'd submitted as much as uh, 12 to 24 months before. The FDA simply did not have the resources it needed to evaluate all these new drug applications to address the AIDS and the epidemic at this critical time. And that, along with other factors, was a key part of Congress's recognition in the early 1990s that the FDA needed more resources. And part of why Congress originally chartered the Prescription Drug User Fee Act in 1992, authorizing the FDA to collect user fees associated with companies' applications for regulatory approval of new human drugs. Congress at the time called for a renewal of the BUFA every five years, and this has happened five times now with broad bipartisan support, and we look at the BUFA 6 today. And over the subsequent 25 years, as ITIF writes in the report how the Prescription Drug Use of Fiat supports life sciences innovation and speeds cures, Purdue has truly been instrumental in equipping the Food and Drug Administration with the resources it needs to make safe, timely, accurate determinations regarding the safety and efficacy of new drug applications, while applying best practices in regulatory science to ensure that America has become the world's leader in biomedical innovation. In fact, since Purdue's 1992 launch, the median approval time for, or the median, the, the median determination time for a drug application at the FDA has fallen by over two-thirds, 
from almost 30 months to under 10. Moreover, by providing greater stability, certainty, and predictability in the drug approval determination process, as well as by providing gateway reviews, enabling innovators to better understand and to meet the FDA's clinical trial requirements, Padufa has contributed to more innovative drugs being launched and reaching patients first here in the United States. In fact, whereas in 1992, only 10% of the new drugs that were introduced to the world were introduced first in the United States, today that figure exceeds 60%. So the reality is that Padufa has become a foundational pillar alongside robust public private investment in life science and research and strong intellectual property protections in making America the world's most fertile environment for life sciences innovation. It's why between 1997 and 2012, more than half of the IP related to the world's new medicines was conceived in America and why over the past 17 years, U.S. headquartered enterprises have developed and brought more new drugs to market than companies from the next five nations combined. In fact, <laughs> since then, since 2000, America's life sciences companies have introduced 550 new FDA-approved drugs, and there are more than 7,000 new drugs under clinical development today worldwide, over 70% of them first in their class, addressing uh, diseases and conditions which are previously unsolved by medical science. So really, the five Padufas to date have been key enablers of this, and Padufa 6 seeks to build on those prior iterations with several important new provisions, such as supporting the development and application of 21st century regulatory sciences approaches to drug development, including creating a pathway for greater use of real-world evidence and regulatory decision-making, and advancing innovative new clinical trial approaches. Padufa 6 will also seek to better incorporate patient perspectives in the drug development process, while also creating new pathways for breakthrough therapies and rare diseases. And most importantly, Kudifa 6 will continue to ensure that the FDA has the resources, tools, and personnel it needs uh, to hire really world-class scientific researchers uh, and keep pace with the extraordinary rate of private sector biomedical innovation. So in conclusion, from the ITF think tank perspective, Purdue 6 really represents the best of the public and private sector working in concert to develop uh, new cures and speed them to market. Uh, ITF calls on Congress to extend the good work it did in passing the 21st Century Curers Act and complete a timely reauthorization of Purdue in order to ensure that America's biopharmaceutical industry can continue to develop uh, new treatments to help patients live uh, safer and healthier lives. Uh, I think most of our panelists will agree with that point of view. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Representative Link. Uh, thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Probably, I'm over miking for the small room, but I'll try. Uh, as I look out at the audience, try to gauge uh, uh, who's in the room, uh, I see a lot of folks here who probably don't have a lot of memories of the 1970s and 80s. Am I right? Some of them. Yes, maybe a few of us. Um, Steve mentioned about the fact that uh, there was this rush in the 1980s to get drugs on the market for HIV AIDS. When that horrific disease began to break out across the United States in the late 1970s, no one knew what was going on. It was called a strange form of cancer. You couldn't, couldn't even figure out. It didn't have a name. It took a long time to figure out what it was. Now, at the time when the drug companies finally identified what it was, and, and it was a death sentence. And if you had HIV AIDS, you began to get your affairs in order because that was it. There was no cure. And as the drug companies of the United States began to uh, do investigations as to how to fight this horrific disease, the FDA itself had some problems. At that time, it took a lot longer uh, in many instances to get drugs approved during the 1970s and 80s by the FDA than it did the other six uh, pharmaceutical agencies around the globe. It was much easier and, and people would say, I, I used to be in the news media and we go out to do news stories and people would say, why is it that we can get, you can get these drugs, whether it's for cancer or whether it's for whatever disease, you can get them in Europe a lot quicker than you can get them in the United States and people were upset because it was a life and death issue. That they were they knew that these drugs, people were informed, even though we didn't have the internet back then, they knew that these drugs were available other places, but they weren't available here, and they were watching 
as their family members and their friends and others suffered and in many instances died, not getting access to drugs that were available in other countries. Now the FDA, it wasn't totally their fault. They had to live with a regimen that was dependent upon the United States Congress to pass appropriations bills. And we have seen in recent years how effective that all goes. Regardless of which party's in charge, it's not something that you can set your watch by or even set your calendar by. Uh, it, it, you can't be dependent upon that. And so it was with that background that Congress, in its wisdom, in a bipartisan fashion, passed the loop in 1992. And what happened in the interim is really quite remarkable. We went from a period of time when drugs were being approved quicker overseas to now where they're being approved, three-fourths of the drugs are being approved quicker here in the United States. 20 of 23 oncology drugs approved faster in the United States by the FDA than by the European Medicines Agency. That's just a remarkable turnaround. So you can't argue with the success of Padufa. Uh, this has been an unquestioned success for American patients, for the domestic economy, and for facilitating access to safe and effective new medicines, and providing regulatory certainty to encourage the, the private sector make investments in life sciences. And you know, we all were very happy to see, uh, regardless of a party, Vice President Bar uh, Biden uh, with his moonshot for cancer. Cancer touched all of us in some form or other, if not you personally, somebody in your family or somebody you know and love. And so to see uh, the advances made, but in order for that to happen, you have to encourage the investment into finding these new drugs. The DUFA allows that. There's a certainty with the way this happens. There's a certainty also uh, with the people who work at the FDA who are able, you know, some of the brightest minds in the world choose rather than to go out and make big money to work for the United States government at the, at the FDA and to determine whether these new drugs are safe and effective. If we don't pass PDUFA in a timely fashion and without adding a whole lot of extra things to it, those people don't have certainty in their careers and their lives. And you can't blame them for walking away from the FDA and maybe deciding to go somewhere else to work. Uh, so all of these things that we're talking about, it's the effectiveness of the drugs we're bringing to market, it's the timeliness of it, it's the turnaround and how the United States FDA has become the gold standard for approval of drugs globally. They are safe, they are effective, that doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes on occasion, but we're very safe and very effective with a, with a, a uh, success rate that would get you in any Hall of Fame. Now, uh, the, the result of this is that PDUFA has played an important role in supporting a lot of dramatic advances in the practice of medicine like new things, gene therapy, immune oncology, and personalized medicines, just to name a few. So we're, we live in a fantastic time where there are new products coming into the marketplace, new kinds of medicines, not the old pills that you used to take. And, and the FDA, because of the DUFA, and because of the timely bipartisan reauthorization every five years, they're able to keep up with the science that the pharmaceutical companies across the country are working on. Uh, PDUFA uh, 6, uh, the, the gold letters uh, have been negotiated between the agency and the pharmaceutical industry over the past several years, the technical aspects of the program, um, the amount of structures of user fees the industry will pay, the performance commitments that will guide the FDA and the human drug review activities, all of this has already been determined. A lot of the hard work is done, and now Congress must not put a lot of Christmas tree ornaments on this and just make sure that they pass it as clean as possible. Now, I'll go back to the point of, of the passage of Padufa in 1992. Uh, something I think that some of the other speakers here will probably allude to as well. The industry was not clamoring to pay a user fee. The drug industry didn't, you know, the, when, when this whole thing was proposed, they weren't clamoring to say, yeah, tax us more, tax us more. Let us pay more money to the federal government. Sounds like a great idea. But the reality was that it turned into a great idea. Once they saw 
the speed and the effectiveness of getting these new drugs that they were developing into the marketplace. And again, as Steve said, this is remarkable. It took 33 months on average to get a new drug into the marketplace. Now it's down to 10 months. And priority drugs, six months. That's incredible. In that reduced time, how many more lives are able to be saved? How many more people are going to have their lives improved because we've cut down on that time period? So beyond simply reauthorizing to do it, but before its current authorization expires at the end of September, Congress needs to pass the DUFA legislation this summer in order to avoid the disruption at the FDA. If Congress fails to act in a timely manner, the FDA will be required to notify thousands of agency employees whose jobs are supported by user fees that the program may lapse, in which case they would all be furloughed. And how many of them we would lose, we don't know. Needless to say, it wouldn't help morale, performance, or work retention, and the results would be devastating to patients all across America. There's good news, though, even though this is, no doubt, a complicated political environment, particularly in regard to health care policy. Uh, Padufa reauthorizations have a long history of being bipartisan. We hope this, was, this will be the case as well. Congress has a great opportunity to deliver for American patients and for taxpayers alike. I'm reauthorizing to do for this summer, and we hope they do. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning. Um, pleased to be here. And Stephen asked me to talk a little bit about uh, what the user fees mean and the practical impact at the agency. So I'm going to provide you some thoughts about that, and this is reflecting on the reauthorization cycle from 2007, which um, went a little long. It was the uh, Statute was signed September 27th, um, so there was a little bit of angst, and I'll talk about what that angst means. Uh, and that's why in the next cycle it was reauthorized much sooner, and I think now we're on a path to, to have it be much sooner. But I want to talk a little bit about um, the practical impact in how FDA does its work, and as well as what is really this intriguing idea of having regulated industry, the user, talking with the regulator, about what needs to improve. Um, it might even be something that would be well replicated in other areas of government um, because you have this constant interaction. So building from what Stephen and Congressman Clink laid out in this, just the great description of the original user fee and the workload disparity, that there were more applications than there were people, uh, let me talk a little bit about how FDA generally approaches its job. So the agency is, um, an expert in implementing its statute and regulations. So they're looking at how do we protect and promote the public health as it relates to drug review and approval, device review and approval, and a whole lot of other activities. Um, they are very focused on their specific role and the path of how things move through their process. In that focus, it means that they don't have a lot of exposure to what's happening in industry. They see it in snapshots. So they see it in the new drug application that comes in, or in um, some of the post-marketing surveillance work, or some of the things that happen after a drug is on the market. But um, generally, kind of uh, keeping pace with things like changes in manufacturing, or uh, where there's new research and developments, they're challenged to keep up with what's happening in the industry that they regulate, because they're very focused on the day-to-day um, activity that's coming in their door. So what is it that they're being asked to do in reviewing new drug applications or, or some other sort of activity? The user fees, and particularly the reauthorization process, drives that regulated industry interaction with the regulators so that they can have those conversations about um, what's working, how is the agency activity being perceived and received within industry, as well as now in the broader stakeholder community. I'm anxious to hear what Sophia and Keisha have to say about that because we've done a much better job in the process to say this is also about making sure that the agency does a better job with all of um, its activity and engaging with stakeholders. So the user fee reauthorization process and the negotiation of the commitments and the goal letters allows FDA to hear directly from industry and to jointly then say, how should we improve? What metrics should we set? What targets should we meet? What should we focus on? 
Um, patient-focused drug development is one that I like to, to highlight as something that's been in prior user fee agreements and has been really interesting and was a, quite a pivot, I think, for industry and the regulator, um, industry and FDA, to say how do we focus more on the patient in developing our products and understanding what is important to the patient. That was um, driven by, in large part, by the user fee agreements and the, and the commitments that the agency made to say, how do we want to do this better? So I provide that as an example of, of how the user fees, from a very practical standpoint, affect the agency, because they now have um, the resources through the, the financial resources of the user fees to support the people to engage in the activity to then interact with regulated industry and not only continue um, to move the freight through and to do what they need to do in reviewing these applications, but also to have a better understanding of how to continue to improve the agency, to continue to improve innovation in the life sciences, which at the end of the day, as patients, we all benefit from. Um, and hopefully you haven't had to benefit from it yet, and it's still a ways off, um, but it, it really makes a difference. So I think overall, um, the user fees generally improve the culture of the entire agency because it drives this um, idea that industry and the regulator are working together to bring cures to patients. And so what is it that they can do? Um, it doesn't mean that FDA says yes every time. It absolutely does not mean that. <laughs> they still say no. It's reviewing the evidence but reviewing the evidence in a consistent and a predictable manner so that then industry can learn from that and say, all right, what is it that we need to do next time to bring um, up something to the, the agency that would make, through, make it through? Um, I will say that the user fees also present um, you and your roles and in, in, in particular serving members of Congress to amend the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And um, amend it, it has been. Um, through each of the reauthorization cycles, um, <clears throat> the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act is now quite long. And so I think your challenge in this reauthorization is to say, what are the things that need to be in statute? Because they're an enduring change. And what are the things that need to be communicated to the agency? Because there's a difference. Right? If, if, I, if I may speak for the great work that you've done, Congressman Clay, there's a, there's a difference in what should be in statute and codified in saying here, in fact, is the foundation of what it is that we want to have happen versus some of the other things that are communicated, you have a fair amount in the commitment letter and, and our um, admonitions, it seems like a pejorative word, that are really you know, saying to the agency what are things that should be done differently. Um, they're, they're two different things. So do think about what are the statutory pieces that are needed that will be enduring? And then what is the other information that you want to provide the agency? Because I have no doubt that you're hearing from stakeholders about um, this package and what should be in it and is moved forward. So that part of the dialogue is really important as well. So I'll just I'll close. Um, I appreciate you um, mentioning, Congressman Clink, the um, anxiety that can be felt at the agency in this time of reauthorization. It's very real. Um, when I was chief of staff at the agency, it was during the 2007 cycle. Uh, and in, it was about in mid-July that there was the question of who, who will receive a, um, a RIF notice, a reduction in force notice. And at that time, we were able to say, looking at the Congress, looking at the progress that Congress is making, in fact, we don't need to issue those notices. So we did the paperwork. We knew who would be affected. But we were able to communicate to Congress that we saw enough progress and were confident in it. Um, that's still anxiety-inducing um, in the staff. Um, and, and I think that's why we've seen in other cycles, an, a, a, an earlier reauthorization is just a much more comfortable place to be as we get into the, the summer of Washington. Um, so I applaud the work that's been done. It's great that the package is moving forward. Um, I think we've seen a lot of success in the industry FDA negotiation 
as well as the congressional consideration of it. And I am, I am anxious to applaud the passage of what I know will continue to improve the agency. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks to Steve and ITIF for the um, opportunity to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to start the conversation on how um, user fee agreements uh, benefit patients. And to do that, I'll give you a bit of background on our organization, the Alliance for Aging Research, and how we came to uh, focus on these types of issues as a priority. Uh, the Alliance for Aging Research has been around for 30 years, so uh, many of us do remember the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, it, it primarily came about largely because um, there was no senior organization out there at the time that was focused on the value of research, trying to increase prioritization of research and aging, and applying it to help keep people healthier longer. Um, so in the very early days of the Alliance for Aging Research, we were primarily focused on um, increasing funding for the National Institutes of Health and making sure that um, research was going on in diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Um, but we didn't have much of a focus on what was happening after the research was funded. It was about 10 years ago um, that we did a bit of a landscape that looked at the major diseases of aging that were likely to have an impact on society and looked at how that research was or was not being effectively translated into interventions for aging people. And um, two diseases that we started to hone in on were Alzheimer's disease and physical frailty um, as, a, as a disease in, in older adults. They're the primary drivers of uh, institutionalization of older adults and everything we know about how people want to age, they want to age in their home independent, as healthy as they can be for as long as they can be. So we felt that there was some role to play. Um, it was 10 years ago that we started a, a coalition that Steve mentioned called Accelerate Cures and Treatments for Alzheimer's Disease. And really what that coalition did was um, it, it created a single point of advocacy similar to what had gone on in the HIV AIDS community um, to engage with the Food and Drug Administration on um, bringing them to the table as more proactive partners in drug development for Alzheimer's. Um, we felt that uh, from some conversations we had had uh, with folks at the agency and some of the companies who were developing products uh, for Alzheimer's disease, um, that there, there was not a, a sort of sense of proactivity uh, that the agency was approaching Alzheimer's at the time as, when we, know, when we see a good drug, we'll know it when we see it, and we'll be prepared to respond to it, which is not an unnatural thing uh, for diseases that are, are very early in development. Um, but we didn't want to take that um, and uh, line down, really, so we um, started this coalition. And what we found, um, we met with the commissioner at the time, and uh, there was a receptivity to working with the community on um, trying to build the evidence base to get at better uh, product development. And so um, FDA did everything that they had done uh, for the, the HIV AIDS community. Um, we worked with them to make sure that there was a mechanism for bringing patients and caregivers to the table um, if a drug was successful at getting to the point of an advisory committee. Um, we also um, asked them for some mechanism where um, it, it's not just the Center for Drugs that's involved in, um, in, in having some, some input into what happens with, um, with new drug applications for, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. There's an imaging component related to diagnostics that's important to make sure is, is reflected. Um, and also, it's, it's such an important disease for them that it really needs to be um, considered at the highest level. So um, they did create uh, what's called the Neurology Across FDA Working Group where um, they have uh, input from all the different centers um, at the FDA who have a hand in, um, in, in providing input into what happens with Alzheimer's drugs. And uh, this is something that's, that's a bit of a predecessor to um, the Centers of Excellence model that was adopted in the 21st Century Cures Act that I'm sure uh, you're we'll familiar with. Um, and then the last thing, um, and it sort of uh, leads into to some of the priorities that we care about as part of PDUFA, um, is, uh, is to the ability to engage with the review divisions um, on an annual basis in a workshop where um, we talk about the, the various regulatory challenges to, um, to how FDA can, can work with companies and work with the scientific community to really, um, you know, it, there are just hurdles that every company faces with um, running long clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. Um, issues related to acceptability of biomarkers for the disease. Um, where we are really understanding what's going on in people's brains um, with Alzheimer's disease and, and how you can target that with, um, with, with drugs in an effective way. And um, the review division has, um, has gladly not only participated in these meetings, but helped us start planning it, and even looked at the future of, it's, it's not gonna be a silver bullet. Um, the HIV AIDS, it's a, it's a multi-drug combination uh, that's keeping people, people alive. And with Alzheimer's disease, it's um, naive to think that there's gonna be just one drug. That, um, that, that really solves the disease. And so they've worked with us on meetings and getting at what is combination therapy actually going to look like 
for Alzheimer's disease and how do we work together on trials. Um, so the, the, the culture um, at FDA, I think, has, has changed a lot over the last 10 years. But what we feel we need to do as advocates is, is provide FDA with the resources they need to not only review the drugs when they come in, but support all of these other activities that they're already doing to, um, to, to work with the community. And so um, we started our engagement on the UDC agreements. Um, we could do for five. Uh, prior to that, we weren't actually allowed to formally engage. And there are a number of groups here today that I want to recognize um, who are involved in that. Um, Andrew from the National Alliance for Mental Illness, me from the Epilepsy Foundation, and um, there, there are a number of others who have, who have been involved in those dialogues. But it, it goes on for 18 months. Um, we start with a public meeting at FDA and then monthly meetings where you meet uh, with, the, with the negotiators uh, for the user fee agreements, and you talk through uh, what's going on between um, industry and FDA in those negotiations, and we get the opportunity to respond, which is a really cool opportunity for groups to say, you know, here's what we'd like to see. And um, I know that some of the challenges that, um, that Susan talked about with the 2007 um, user fee agreement were largely because groups like ours were left out of the process in a lot of different ways, and we were starting to say, there are things that we want to see happening through the that, that will help FDA do their job and will get better treatments to patients. Um, so we have all engaged in this process. Um, in in FDUFA 5, um, some of the meaningful changes that we saw uh, coming out of the negotiations uh, was this emphasis on uh, how can you quantify and better determine uh, what the risks and benefits of treatments are, uh, providing the patient input. Um, this is something that um, FDA had really not put together in a systematic way before, um, and it was difficult for um, companies and also patients uh, to communicate with FDA about um, how they would weigh the benefits and risks of potential treatments. So that was something that was um, a big priority of ours in FDA for five, and I know uh, for a number of other groups. Um, for benefit risk, um, another big piece of that is patient-focused drug development, because if you're not designing trials in a way that is um, being responsive to the, to the needs of patients and what's most meaningful to them, um, you can't expect them to accept the high level of risk that's going to come with a product um, if, if it's not uh, providing the, the commensurate benefit. And so there was um, the addition of fees as part of Hadoofa 5 for FDA to hold um, just over 20 meetings. Um, they're calling them the patient-focused drug development meetings. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, but it was the opportunity for, um, for FDA to select diseases where they wanted to have a better understanding about how patients were experiencing the disease. Um, depending on the disease, they also wanted to hear caregiver input about um, the burden of disease and what they would like to see from potential treatments, and also start to gauge um, this benefit-risk dynamic and um, how, how uh, the patient caregiver voice could be better integrated into that process. And then after those meetings, there's something called the Voice of the Patient Report that comes out um, that, that really um, is sort of a point in time um, analysis where reviewers, if they're faced with having to review a drug uh, for something that disease they're not familiar with, um, they can refer back to that and get a sense of what the discussion was um, during that meeting. And um, it also gives the, the community an opportunity to start looking at any sort of gaps and um, endpoints that might be acceptable uh, for use in clinical trials. And so um, it was a great start and something that was built on in 21st century cures and uh, to do the six actually. Um, make some meaningful strides in that area as well. And so uh, we also, um, as part of five, were supportive of the breakthrough therapy pathway. Um, we knew we were a long ways away uh, from, from having a uh, drug that could uh, potentially be a candidate for use in the breakthrough therapy program, but we thought that the concept of if you had a, a disease with unmet need and you had a population that was highly likely to respond to a treatment, um, the fact that FDA could get that through as quickly as possible uh, was very attractive to us. And so um, we supported that. And one thing that's actually included in six um, are resources to support the um, breakthrough pathway, um, which is exciting <coughs> because that was one of those things that was tacked on um, as part of Fidesia, uh, but there, there wasn't resources um, included to support that. So the, um, the ability for FDA to, to have some dedicated staff um, to that process, I think, will be um, really meaningful. And then there are some other things um, that are included in six um, that are um, important to note um, that don't actually cost a lot of money, but get at this issue of um, you know how you, how FDA can can really start engaging as early as possible with um, drug sponsors to be able to accelerate uh, products through the pathway. And uh, we've seen this with Alzheimer's um, in particular that there are still a lot of lingering questions around the use of biomarkers for disease, and particularly the use of biomarkers as surrogate endpoints. Um, to really be able to uh, rely on them uh, to show that if you make a change in that 
endpoint that you're, you're going to make a meaningful change to patients. Uh, there are a lot of questions. And so, um, you know, companies make assumptions about including these types of endpoints in their trial, but it's very late in the game when they can have conversations with FDA um, about the, the viability of using a certain endpoint as the basis for an approval. And one of the things that's um, interesting about the Paducah 6 agreement is it does include um, language that allows for those conversations to happen as early as possible. So it can, it can even happen at the end of phase one. And um, it, it can help with decision making in a lot of ways because if someone knows, um, the company knows that there's a lot of research that needs to be done still um, to use that biomarker, they can change course and maybe move in another direction. Um, they can discontinue their program, which everyone would hate to have happen for a for potential drug for Alzheimer's, but if it's really going to put uh, patients, at, expose them to a drug that's not going to benefit them, that's something that, that companies might want to know up front. And then, um, you know, I think that if there's an opportunity to fill research gaps um, or to make things better, there is an opportunity for groups like ours to really engage in making sure that the, the research is being supported to get there. So um, there's a lot in there um, that is really beneficial, and I know I'm probably leaving a lot out. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions later, and I'll turn it over to Keisha. Okay, thank you very much, Cynthia. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen, and I want to thank ITF for including the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network in this conversation today on this really important legislation that's really timely because we know we've had action that's going to be happening over here um, on the outside speak tomorrow. Um, American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network actually um, is an organization that represents cancer patients, uh, individuals in treatment, uh, survivors, and the millions of their family members who support them through their treatment. And um, as an organization that represents the millions of individuals who have cancer uh, in their families, uh, we strongly believe that the Prescription Drug User Free Program has been successful since it was uh, created in 1992. The chronic, rare, and uh, disability patient communities really do rely on FDA to ensure that innovative, safe, and effective treatments reach those um, who are in need. And as we've heard here today, uh, the Paducah program really has allowed to make sure that individuals who need access to innovative treatments are able to receive them in a timely fashion. Um, the user free program continues to meet its goal to ensure that safe, effective medicines get to U.S. patients as quickly as possible. And as Representative Clint mentioned, cancer drugs um, and the approval of cancer drugs over um, the, a number of years since the creation of the user free program have really benefited from the process. We know that many different diseases have benefited and we've seen the cancer drugs be the one that clearly has. Um, we've been able to have a strong partnership with FDA to make sure that that's possible. We know that cancer, uh, depending on the stage of when it's diagnosed, having access to treatments um, early on uh, can make a lot of difference in the disease, disease progression. As Congress uh, considers its fifth year authorization of the program, we're encouraged with the changes in court included in the current legislation as being considered, and we believe that it will build an already successful program. We're encouraged by a number of the provisions that have been already uh, brought up today, but I'll mention just a couple as well. Um, the incorporation of rare disease staff and in the um, product review teams, increased uh, resources dedicated to biomarker development and validation, the advance of the science supporting the use of real world um, evidence, increasing efforts to better hire and retain high quali uh, qualified staff at FDA, and increased resources to account for the added workload really generated as part of the success of the breakthrough therapy pathway. Uh, that Cynthia mentioned that really is uh, extremely important, and we know that we've seen how that really has moved forward from Paducah 5, and we're really looking forward to see how it can continue to move forward with resources to improve Paducah 6. We're also uh, pleased with provisions in the legislation that will allow FDA to de dedicate new staff with patient-focused drug development expertise and responsibilities. And we're hopeful that the provision that's included um, will be implemented to allow for additional staff to be focused primarily on incorporating and addressing these important patient needs. And this is, it was great to hear you say, and, uh, and Cynthia as well, that of course, making sure that the patient perspective included um, throughout the drug development process beginning all the way through uh, to the product actually being brought to market is really important and it's something that ACSP has paid uh, very close attention to. It's imperative that this new uh, designated staff in, in this new agreement uh, in the legislation that Congress is actually uh, working on now not simply become additional review staff um, indistinguishable from other staff but rather make sure that they have personal performance goals 
and a reporting structure that provides incentives for them to strive to make drug development and review more patient focus. That is something that we really have um, continued to focus on and have conversations with uh, staff as the legislation has moved forward. Since the last to do, to do for authorization, um, ACS CAN has been laser focused really on examining and continuing the dialogue regarding patient involvement in the medical product development process. We're actively supportive of the patient representative program at the FDA that was actually established in the, in the early 1990s and was actually formalized in the last food for agreement. The goal of the program is to ensure patient input into the benefit risk analysis by providing a process by which patients are present during FDA-sponsored meetings and advisory committees. Patients bring their specific disease experience to these discussions, but also acting as a general advocate for patient-focused research design and regulatory decisions. Uh, Cynthia mentioned in the 20 meetings that was included in the last PDUFA that was really, we saw the fruit of really, really opportunity uh, to bring patient groups who before that point hadn't had the opportunity to even really know who the correct staff people at FDA were who were working on these important drugs and making sure they had that ability to have that conversation. Uh, the patient representative program is one that we believe that is a, a firm grounding ability for staff at the FDA to have that continued dialogue uh, with patients as well. We believe that the improved education and analysis of patient experience anticipated by the Dupa 6 legislation will leave patient representatives from single-handedly having to extrapolate their own personal experiences to represent all patients with the same disease. However, at the same time, the existence of better data on patient experience and expectations does not obviate the need for continued direct patient involvement in the regulatory process. Patients are still needed to serve as general advocates for patients when trials are designed and regulatory decisions are made, and we'll, we believe that the patient representative program remains even more relevant today than it was when it was first established over two decades ago. We remain encouraged by the language included in the reauthorization language that continues to elevate the need for patient involvement and alignment in the product development process, and pleased to see a request for comment uh, that was actually released um, a number of weeks ago from FDA asking for feedback on a potential creation of an Office of Patient Affairs at the FDA. So there is this program that exists um, to make sure that patients are included through the, um, the, comment, um, the comment review process and all the way through um, of drugs being actually taken to market. Um, but having an office that actually does focus on that is something that we think is really important. I would believe that it's essential for, F for the success of F FDA's efforts to enhance patient engagement as outlined in the user fee agreement, uh, the FDA's uh, FDASIA uh, process that we've seen go forward uh, five years ago, and the recently passed 21st Century Cures um, legislation that we know also had some really important legislation and provisions in it as well. ACS can will be submitting comments to FDA, FDA detailing our support for the creation of the Patient Affairs Office and providing suggestions on how the proposal could be strengthened. So this is outside of the Purdue for Agreement, but we thought it was important to mention today because it is something that's going to be moving forward on um, this timely because of uh, the ability to come and will end on June 12th. Um, but the advent of new and innovative patient engagement programs with the FDA is more important than ever that there be an office that can provide general coordination both internally and externally. And we probably believe that it's time that organizations like ours and other patient organizations weigh in to make sure the Purdue agreement moves forward. And we look forward to seeing how we can really build on uh, the, the patient involvement and conversation with FDA staff through the ability to actually establish an office. So I will uh, stop there and thank you again for the opportunity to really provide the patient perspective on this important debate. Okay, thank you very much, Keisha. So as I said, we expect our person to get at about 11 o'clock. Um, so for the moment, uh, let's, uh, uh, let me first ask if our panelists have any uh, comments that they'd like to make or amplify based upon what they heard pointed out by the other speakers. Well then let's do this. Let's take questions from the audience if we have any uh, for a few minutes. Um, while you're thinking of your questions, and I'm sure after such a stimulating uh, set of presentations you will have many, so while you're cogitating and formulating those questions, let me ask one to our, uh, our panelists here. Um, so, so Keisha, 
uh, from 1998 to 2014, there were 103 attempts to develop melanoma drugs, which resulted in 96 unsuccessful attempts, seven successful ones, 78 attempts to develop brain cancer drugs, which led to three successes and 75 failures, and 177 attempts to develop new treatments for lung cancer, of which 10 were successful, and 167 were unsuccessful. And for all the panelists, this is part of a broader situation where, in fact, today less than 12% of the candidate medicines that make it into phase one clinical trials actually get approved by the FDA, and that's actually half the rate of a decade ago, which seems to me to suggest that the process of developing new medicines today is actually much harder than it used to be because we're really at the point of pushing the boundaries of medical science forward into tackling new types of intractable diseases like Alzheimer's and, and, and cancer. So given that kind of context then, uh, it, it seems that Hadoop is really critical to continuing the, 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 the broad set of, of, of policies uh, that enable innovators to know that, um, that they can uh, you know, be uh, embarking upon the risky, expensive, and uncertain process of investing in these impact drugs. <laughs> So I think that from the cancer perspective, and I think Cynthia had mentioned this, the, the risk benefit um, that has to, that process that FDA has to go through is really important. Uh, I think when you have a disease like cancer, that risk benefit conversation changes um, it very differently than it made for other, other med medications. And making sure that you have patients who can have access to medications in that time and fashion, and having access to medications that, they, that we know have allowed to go through that FDA process is really important. Um, I would say that, as you said, you know, all the medications that go through these trials, through the clinical trial process and through all the procedures they have to go through, there are a few that come through. Um, I think from our perspective, one thing that we really think is important um, in, in the agreement currently is the use of real-world world evidence, for example, in making sure you can't do a full clinical trial process for a particular drug. Having FDA to have those tools and have that expertise um, um, available at FDA and the staff who have the background to make sure that those medications can move forward based on the information evidence that they can be able to pull um, is really, really important because we know it takes a lot of um, Medi a lot of treatments that actually may not make it to market, but those the ones that are able to move forward make the difference in lives of, of millions of patients. Thank you. <laughs> if I could add to that, I think um, the other thing that's happened here in our in, in the evolution of the user fees is that if you think about the, the metaphor of uh, train tracks and a railroad, the early user fee agreements, we were fixing the railroad and getting the people there and, and, and really improving the system. Now we have a better sense of the system and how to move the applications through, but now we need to take it to that next generation. It's, it's more challenging to, to develop drugs today because we, we have more opportunities on the horizon, but it's also more difficult. So we, we've done, it, it was difficult work, but now we have really challenging work in the next stages to say how do we continue to um, harness the science to yield the moonshot, the, the results of the moonshot, and how do we um, move to that next iteration where we'll look at your genetic information and align the therapeutic intervention based on that genetic information and, and, and truly make an advance. Um, it sounds trite, but that's harder, and that's a, a piece to move move through here. I, I also want to to add one piece. Um, we also have to recognize that every time, the FDA is unique in that every time the agency approves a drug or a device, they have increased their workload in perpetuity because they're now responsible for monitoring, um, you know, and keeping track of the use of that because we learn things in real world evidence. Um, we sometimes find things that, that would change how that drug should be used that you don't find out in clinical trials, you only find out in real life. So it is a dynamic that as we get better at reviewing um, the, the new drug applications and the device applications, and we get better at doing that work, you also then on the flip side increase the agency's workload in making sure that those drugs and devices are used the way that we're supposed to, and we continue to learn about that use. If I can uh, just jump in as well, um, the, the, the numbers that you cite about the, uh, the small percentage of drugs that actually make it to market also demonstrate the billions of dollars that are spent on developing drugs that go down the drain. 
they never really come to market. And uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, and you start to continue to attract investment uh, so that you can bring that next variable drug to the market. One of the groups I've had the honor of working with, uh, uh, along with the pharmaceutical industry, is a group called PILMA. It stands for the Pharmaceutical Industry Labor Management Association, and basically amounts to uh, a lot of the labor unions, mostly building trades. And these are folks that uh, build the facilities where this research is done, where these drugs are manufactured. We were in uh, a, a congressman's office from uh, the state of New Jersey a few years ago, and uh, staff that we were talking to said, my father worked at the same pharmaceutical company facility his entire career, put four boys through college, working at the same facility, building new plants, new uh, clean rooms, new laboratories, new re so all that money has to be brought in. And interestingly enough, Pilma has put out uh, a series of ads. We talk about whether or not PDUFA is uh, authorized or not, and what it means uh, to diseases and to people that have those diseases and need those drugs. It also means a great deal to the people who work at those facilities. And the ads they put out show, for example, one you know, big muscular guy sitting on top of a bulldozer. And he says, I, I use my bulldozer to fight cancer. And it's true. He's helping to build the facility and do a great job of it so that this research can be done. So do you think that Padoof is important to them also, not just to the employees that may be riffed at the FDA, but to uh, all of these other folks who are out there day in and day out building the facilities, doing the research, developing the drugs at the at the uh, pharmaceutical companies as well. And one of the things that we do when we walk in, and it's very interesting to, to, to walk into either a Republican or Democratic office when you were representing both the industry and organized labor together on an issue. Don't normally hear that. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the point that we make is that over 3.2 million direct jobs are related to this industry. Now, that's lost sometimes when you talk about the importance of the DUFA and of the research into fighting the drugs, but th this is an economic engine that drives a, a large, vast areas. I come from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, we've got a pretty good uh, uh, vibrant drug industry uh, in the Commonwealth, so we understand what that means as well. I'd just like to comment a bit about the, the length of time uh, that it takes to bring drugs to market. Um, a, a few of the things that were started in 21st century cures that have been talked a lot about expanding beyond um, using cancer is um, innovative trial design and things like disease modeling and statistical methods. And I'm not an expert in any one of those three, but I actually understand uh, why they're really important for diseases like Alzheimer's. Is as you understand people's genetic makeup and um, you know how they're potentially likely to respond to treatments, um, it allows you to design trials where their models lengthy and expensive, and they're, they're really targeted at people who are, are potentially going to be the ones to benefit the most from drugs, and that'll like, drastically reduce the time it takes to bring drugs to market, and also recruitment time. Recruitment is a huge challenge. Right now, there are a number of late-stage development programs that are going in with Alzheimer's that are funded by the pharmaceutical industry and also by the federal government, and everyone's competing for the same patients to get them in their trials, and it's a luxurious problem to have, but it really is a problem. And a lot of times, trial sites have to shut down because they can't recruit enough people. And so that's um, a huge barrier. And the uh, PDUFA 6 agreement actually includes um, mechanisms for FDA to engage with stakeholders on how you design these innovative trials, um, how you can um, successfully employ statistical methodology um, that, that's different than what's currently used in clinical trials, and even things like disease modeling. And one of the things that I never fully understood before I started working in, in a disease like Alzheimer's is the importance of dosing and what dosing actually means. And a lot of times, it, it's, it's an educated guess on the dose that is used for, for, for people in trials. And um, what disease modeling can allow you to do is better to, to better um, you know, put science behind how you, you choose dose, and it, it could potentially speed along um, some, of the, some of the compounds, uh, which is really exciting and something that's also 
um, part of six. But to get back to real world evidence, that's something that's hugely important to the older adult population um, outside of Alzheimer's, where older adults tend to be the ones um, that are most available for clinical trials. Um, there is not a lot of data uh, that goes out from, from current trials that's relevant uh, to the older adult population, particularly with people with multiple chronic conditions. So um, the better that um, that process is working and also feeding back into the system beyond what's required of a company that has a drug developed uh, or approved by the FDA is important, not only to understand any sort of safety issues, but also if it's really working well for specific populations and there's the ability to you know, expand um, indications for use of drugs is something that we ultimately would hope um, can come out of real world evidence and support the Great question here. Would you just uh, uh, identify yourself and see what we're going to do? My name is Susan Campbell with Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a little confused by, I thought in your opening remarks, you said that as a result of Paducah, um, times went down and there were more drugs approved. But it sounds like what the panel is saying is there were fewer drugs approved. So, the main point I was making was that the median uh, purity of time to make a determination regarding uh, an approval for a new human drug uh, declined by 33 months on average in 1992 to 110 months today and six months for kind of breakthrough therapies as Representative Clink said. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a separate dynamic then. It, uh, the, the other point I was making just about it, the process of designing, developing, innovating new drugs being more difficult to do than used to be the case in the past. And I also wasn't talking about the, the, the rate of approvals, the percentage of approval success. I was talking about the time period for it. Oh. Right, so one of the ways to think about it is if you have the entire drug development process, what PADUFA in particular, in, in its early agreements, uh, improved was the FDA review time. Yeah. You still have all this pre-FDA time and that's where now you have more of this interaction between regulated industry and FDA to improve this time as well, as well as the success rate. So it's, it's two parts of a broader timeline. So is the success rate improving as a result of that interaction? I think, well, it's certainly um, the packages that get to the agency are better informed. Yes. We used to say that the single greatest determination of whether your product would get approved is how early you talk to the agency yes. in, in your, your process. So, yes, I think we're also reaching this more challenging time in, in science and, and development of saying what, what is it, you know, we're trying to tackle diseases that we haven't before. Um, I'm, I'm a, a pharmacist by training, and decades ago when I practiced pharmacy, we just treated different things because that's what we, we had the, the treatments for. Now it's more challenging. Um, we're getting to the even harder stuff. And then just one other question was the, the idea, I mean, you gave very impressive statistics about um, how our drugs will first be classed better than the next five countries put together. Um, and yet, when you hear these conversations, people always say, you know, there's so many more drugs in the market that aren't in the United States, which is true. That, that was the truth back then, and it still has persisted to, to, you know, these things become kind of uh, accepted as theory. Back in the 70s and 80s, uh, the, the, the ability to get drugs approved prior to Padufa was a lot more in Europe, and they were a lot of So people assume it's still that way today, it is not. In fact, prior to Padoof, and I, I think my percentages are going to be correct, 70% of the drugs were approved overseas first before they were approved here. After Padoof, 75% are approved here prior to being approved overseas. As a result of that, more pharmaceutical companies are introducing their drugs in the United States before they are introducing them abroad. So it, it, that there's a wide variety, it's a 30,000 foot view, but there's a wide variety of things that have occurred to really cause us to have better medicines quicker in the United States and to do this, the reason for that. I'll just add to that, um, using Alzheimer's as an example, um, that's a disease where Europe is struggling with some of the same challenges that we are here in the United States, and that 
there is no sort of um, you know foothold that Europe has that we don't have here in the United States. And in fact, it's one area where um, the regulatory bodies are really collaborating on how they can share knowledge. And um, I had a conversation once with someone who works. Um, the second command of the EMA um, focused on neurology. He said there's no other disease in the neurology space where I can just pick up the phone and call the head of the neurology review division and say, this is what's happening on our land and, and have you experienced this before and how are you handling it? So um, there really is, I think, in some areas, the challenges are so big that um, it really done together. If you a recent study found that Australian patients have to wait up to two years uh, longer for access to many drugs and patients in the United States. It wasn't until September 2016 that Australia implemented an enterprise drug review process, which is something that previous surveys have been discussed. Uh, a couple more questions uh, here. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm with the ACE Institute. And I just wonder if both of you would like to talk a little more about what the drug approval process looked like before we were and and why it was so much slower. So pre-PDUFA, um, FDA was like many other government agencies and, and funded by appropriations. And so those appropriations were, were um, allocated and the agency worked with those dollars to hire the staff and develop the processes to review new drug applications. What PDUFA created was an environment where you could supplement, supplement the appropriations with industry fees. So a, a little bit um, like the fee we pay to get our driver's license. Uh, and, and so it's, it's supplementing that with a fee from industry. And then industry and FDA set out what are the performance metrics. So under what time period, you know, well, setting out time periods for how quickly things will happen. Um, that's one of the things that, that, that user fees have yielded. Another is just this um, greater communication between industry and the FDA and now broader stakeholder groups to say what is it that's working well and what isn't. Um, certainly, the emergence of guidances has been a, another great uh, development. If you think about the regulatory structure, the statutory structure of law, regulation, and guidance, um, uh, the law provides the most foundational information, then the regulation, how we'll do things, and then guidance is really helpful for industry to say, here's, here's what FDA is thinking about, about this area. And the user base has helped to develop not only the um, ideas and prioritization of what guidance should be developed, but also good practices in how you develop those guidances. So in a way, it's been um, a, a now multi-decade process improvement exercise. And so, so you allow, you, you increase the resources, but you also establish um, what it is those resources should be used for and what the agency will be accountable for in that process. And so we're, we're getting better and better, and each user fee agreement helps with that um, combination of appropriations and industry resources and um, then engagement of everyone in the agency's activity to help um, at a very basic level even just explain things and, and advance the dialogue. Does that help? Yes. Hi, um, Noah Bidman from the U.S. Council on Competitiveness. I just had a quick, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I just had a quick question on how Padupa distinguishes helping um, small pharma and biotech companies versus the large ones. So you definitely still have the, the um, all of the small business um, uh, efforts that in, in, that help to help the smaller companies navigate the FDA process. There um, are exemptions to some of the user fees and different structures in that um, to make sure that this isn't um, that there's no intent. We want to make sure that the user fee system works for all sizes of companies, and that's part of the agreements and how, how it's structured, as well as the additional resources that are available to small businesses to navigate the FDA process. So it's, it's a great question and one that, that has been considered as the agreements are crafted. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned Christmas tree ornaments. Can you just say, uh, uh, oh, sorry, Ellen Matthews from Congress and Cooper 
doctor's office. Uh, we were talking about Christmas tree ornaments being a big fear as they bring on the doofus six. Um, and I understand the difference between like necessary regulations versus like communicable needs. But what are your real fears that they attack on the new? And, and I tell you what, if you don't mind, you can. I'll remember that question and hold it. We'll, we'll take it. Uh, I yield to the honorable lady from the state of Colorado. <laughs> So, uh, uh, we're, as I said earlier, we're pleased that Representative Diana Piquette from Colorado will join us. Uh, she's serving her 11th term in Congress as representative of Colorado's first district and as chief deputy with the Democratic Caucus. Uh, she has served on the Committee on Energy and Commerce since her first day in Congress, uh, serving as a vice chair from 2007 to 2010 and as the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations since 2011. As you all know, she is one of Congress's leading experts on cutting-edge scientific research in the life sciences, as well as healthcare and food safety policy. As a Democratic leader on the bipartisan 21st Century Cures Act, uh, Representative Begetta worked to make medical research discoveries and a lot of uh, treatments and cures for patients in the field. Um, Representative Begetta, thank you so much for joining us this morning. The floor is yours. I don't know if you told me, Representative. I don't know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> good to see you. It's, it's good to see everybody. And, and boy, this is sure a timely conversation that you're all having um, on the eve of the full committee markup of the FDA Reauthorization Act. And so, I thought what I would do, with your permission, is just set the stage a little bit about what I see as going on. And then, um, if you have time, I'll take a couple of questions. Uh, that would be great. Um, I've got to tell you that, it ha that Congress has been acutely aware for quite some time that we need to reauthorize the DUFA. And, um, and we all believe that we need to do it in a bipartisan basis and we need to do it as quickly as possible. Um, everybody here knows what it means if we don't get a timely reauthorization. Um, it's going to be a major disservice to our constituents to the companies that rely on this law, and also to the FDA itself. Um, if we didn't reauthorize it in a timely fashion, then of course the FDA would have to lay off many employees. The approval process, which is so critical, and which Fred Upton and I worked so assiduously to um, ensure was, was even more streamlined and improved, would be ground to a halt, and it would delay new treatments for all patients. Now, as you know, the current user fee does not expire until September, but um, you know how it goes around here, and we all really think that we need to get it done before we leave for the August recess. Um, and uh, my staff writes here, and summer is coming up fast. I, mean, I would argue summer's here for, for my Colorado girl. The humidity certainly has, has come in. Um, you know, uh, dating back to the first Padufa bill in 1992, Congress has always been able to act, act in a bipartisan uh, way to do this. And the fees under this agreement have made it really possible for the FDA to staff up and to, to um, get timely reviews for these cutting edge drugs. And so we really, really need to do it. Um, We've, uh, we've already done a significant amount of the work that we need to do with the 21st Century Cures Act that Stephen mentioned. Uh, this was the bill that Congressman Fred Upton and I uh, passed last year with widespread support in both the House and Senate. I must say it was uh, nip and tuck at the end whether we could get it passed in the lame duck session, but the details of the bill were, um, were agreed upon by all parties, and uh, what we one of the many goals of this legislation was to try to streamline and update the way we do drug approval and device approval with the FDA. And so, um, so this site in this cycle, we really think that we've done a lot of the hard work already in the last Congress, and we should be able to uh, get it reauthorized. A couple of the things that we think that cures helped us. Uh, set the stage for the reauthorization um, is the leveraging patient perspective to fight disease, the use of real world evidence in making um, approval determinations, and also the biomarker qualification. And so I think that um, as we look, as I look in my admitted 
cloudy crystal ball to see what's going to happen over the next weeks. I think folks can expect to see sort of a, what, what, not really a slim down uh, Padufa bill, but something that really doesn't tackle a lot of those hard issues that we tackled last year. Now, there are still some questions about how reauthorization will unfold. As happens every time, every five years, when we have to reauthorize Padufa, um, at the last minute, people will attempt to include controversial provisions in this must-pass piece of legislation. Um, for example, the uh, new Trump administration has been pushing Congress to recalibrate the fees, asking um, the industry to carry the entire load of the FDA's budget. Uh, we saw that, yeah, we saw that, we saw that proposal in the president's budget. And again, it was reiterated in the letters to the committees of jurisdiction. Now, not only is this a major departure from current law, but it's wildly controversial. And so I would say, I would have to say that members of Congress from both, politically, from both political parties are not wet, very, um, uh, very warm to this idea. Um, but also, there are other policies that are outside of the scope of the agreement, like off-label communication that, that uh, people like me who really favor a more clean reauthorization or certainly a reauthorization that does not contain controversial elements don't think should be in there. Um, now, the Senate, um, you, know, not, you know what we say here in the House is that uh, we might have our opponents on the other side of the aisle, but the real enemy is the other body. And so uh, I, say, I don't say this lightly, the Senate managed to report a bill out of committee that didn't have some of these poison pill type amendments. So surely the House can do the same thing. I'm very hopeful and optimistic that the House can pass this bill on a bipartisan basis in the next few weeks. And I do remain hopeful that we can pass legislation before we leave for the um, August recess. But all of you can help by A, uh, talking to folks about just how important this is, just how important it is to reauthorize the UFAS. And also, you can help by um, not making some new suggestions about fabulous new ideas that you might have that have been invented <laughs> and might be controversial. So with that, I think I'll stop, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's the thing that I policy. Um, when we talk about passing a clean budget, we, there are some bills that are provisions that have uh, life emergency support, such as the Rape for Children Act, um, and then OPC Monitor Act, which we haven't seen introduced in the House yet, um, but it does have support. So uh, is there enough time to get those excluded? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, as, as the person who was writing the 21st Century Cures Bill literally through the Thanksgiving weekend, if we can find provisions that are acceptable to all parties. And when, we, when we did CURES, what we, what we said to people is, if you have a wonderful new idea, we're not going to reject it out of hand simply because it's, it's kind of late in the process. But we have to make sure, at, at that time we said the four corners, and I think that that would be correct here. House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans will have to agree on some of these uh, uh, provisions. And I do think that there are some provisions like that that will be included. So when I say clean reauthorization, I don't mean 100%. You know, it's the exact same language as before. Yes? Um, I'm the my name is Biotechnology Innovation Organization. And my question would be, what else do you all believe that um, Congress could do other than approving producer hopefully, that could assist with biotechnology companies? Well, um, the, the number one thing that we can do is we can fully fund the NIH and the FDA. And of course, as you may know, the Trump administration has proposed cutting the NIH funding by 19%. This is just on the heels of this tremendously bipartisan 21st century cures. Uh, it passed the Senate 92 to 4. And of course, supported by the agencies uh, Republicans in the House and Senate. And um, if you look at the 2017 continuing resolution that takes us through the rest of this fiscal year, um, uh, not only was that proposal rejected for 2017, 
but actually the $2 billion that we needed on top of the previous budget for cures and for some other provisions was included. So as I talk to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, uh, everybody is committed to the concept of, of full funding for the NIH and the FDA. Um, and, and that includes the funding for cures, but I think that's the number one thing that can help the biotechnology uh, uh, industry the most. Who else? Way in the back. Yes, sir. I'm Max Klein, uh, Representative Castor. Um, this might be a question for Representative Clink, who mentioned this, but about the 1992 yeah, uh, Paducah. Um, he said the industry was not ecstatic at, on first hand about paying this fee, but once they saw the effects of how it might benefit them, they were more willing to. Um, could you explain that a little bit more about how it sort of benefited them as well as? Well, them? no industry ever. You, you want to talk about it, and then I'll, I'll add that. Well, it, it's pretty simple. The in industry, it's you know, just didn't think that a new tax, you're paying more money to the government was going to be a good thing. And the industry's not a monolith. There were some companies that might have had a little different view, but overall, they weren't wild about doing this. But once they saw how it worked and how it cut down the approval times and uh, the, all the benefits it brought, I would say right now the industry is wildly favorable toward Padufa. And uh, they agree with the uh, congressman to get. They want it to be as clean as possible. However, if you have ideas that are bipartisan, bicameral, uh, it, it's not too late in the process to offer those up as well. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Nobody likes a new fee until they realize how it helps them. Yeah. Anyone else? We had a question just as you're all walking in. Okay. Maybe we could ask, uh, oh, well, you time. answered it. No. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to working with all of you as we move forward. Let's let's have a win here. <laughs>